Hello everybody and welcome to this session. My name is Leanne Atkin. I'm a vascular nurse consultant at Mid York NHS Trust, which is here in the heart of Yorkshire. And this session today is about how to recognise problems with your arteries. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen. So this session really is for anybody with an interest in arteries or lower limb disease. And I'm going to try to pitch it uh, that it's suitable for the general public. You think that you have an issue. Um, if you are receiving any treatment from your nurse or your vascular surgeon and you're wanting more information, so if you're a patient of ours, if you are any form of clinical staff, uh, junior clinical staff or even more senior clinical staff, I hope there's something within this session for you. So I think we have to start really at the very beginning. I think we have to start and talk about circulation. So when we talk about circulation, it starts with this thing here that's pumping away on our screen. And I like to refer to the heart as the boiler system in a way. So that's what's going to pump the hot water around the system. So that's what's going to pump the blood around our body. But it's really important to remember that actually it's the lungs that feed the heart, the oxygenated blood. So we need to have healthy working lungs to be able to get good oxygenated blood pumping through this massive muscle. And then what happens is that the heart starts to pump the blood down the arteries, which is within this picture. And the other ones in red, we like to label arteries red, and veins blue. And that's related to the arteries contain oxygenated blood, so it looks bright red, and veins tend to have deoxygenated blood, and therefore they can look a bit blue tingy colour. So if you look at the veins on the back of your hands or in your uh, or on your wrists, they often look blue because they're carrying the deoxygenated blood. And it's the haemoglobin that's bright red and shines brightly when it's carrying those oxygen molecules. So the blood comes from the heart and the major blood vessel it goes down into through your tummy is called the, the aorta, a big massive artery. As it goes, it splits down through at the level of your tummy button, down into your groins, and they're called the iliac arteries. At the level of your hip joint, really, it then splits going down your thighs, and that's called the femoral artery and the superficial femoral artery. As it goes behind the knee, it changes to the popliteal artery. And then there's three arteries that feed the feet. One is called the anterior tibial, the other is called the posterior tibial, and the, further one, the final one is called the perineal. You'll often though hear vascular people call these a collective word called crural vessels. And that just basically means the arteries of the lower leg. You can see that there is a vein that run behind the arteries really, and they're all called the same thing, but rather than called an artery, they're just called a vein. So it's a superficial femoral vein. And you can see that that links the blood back up to the heart. But when we talk about arteries, many people think that actually, that it's a closed system. That if you've got a problem with your arteries, you might get back pressure and therefore get problems with the veins. And it doesn't truly work like that. It is two really separate systems, the arteries and the veins. And what connects this is this capillary bed. So that doesn't truly allow the pressure or the problems with one form of circulation to affect the other. But what can happen is that you can get engorgement of the capillary bed, as you can see on this picture, that capillary bed is a network of very small veins and very small arteries. And the green ones are the lymphatics or the drainage system. And it's actually in that capillary bed where that exchange of the oxygen takes place. So the arteries deposit the oxygen into the tissues around it. And then the veins pick up that blood when it's deoxygenated and take it back up to the heart. So it's not a closed system. So if you've got problems with your arteries, don't worry, it probably won't affect your veins. And vice versa, if you've got problems with your veins, it's probably not going to affect your arteries. Within uh, vascular, we often hear patients saying, oh, I've got poor circulation. And that means something very different to us than what it means to you. You might think that poor circulation is the fact that the, you've got cold feet. 
But actually in our minds, when we talk about poor circulation, we're actually only meaning about the blood getting from the heart down to the feet. And that's what we're gonna concentrate on today. So what can go wrong with the arteries? So um, arterial disease is a name that we use and it can describe the furring up of the arteries, so deposits within the arteries, or narrowing of the artery, or even a complete blockage of the artery. And you may have heard of words such as atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the artery wall, or atheroma, which is deposits within the artery. So in other words, muck blocking up the artery. And you can see in this picture that you have that yellow lipid layer within the artery that is restricting that flow of blood through the arterial lumen. And arterial disease can, affer, can come for many, many reasons, but it's more common in people who smoke, patients with diabetes, patients with high blood pressure and hypertension, patients with high cholesterol, and sometimes it can just happen because of a strong family history. So if your parents or grandparents had issues with arterial disease, you're more likely to get it. And therefore you are much, you need to pay much more attention to your overall health because you are a sitter, let's call it, for developing arterial disease. Now, Arterial disease can happen acutely. You can get acute blockages of the arteries, but that is really, really rare and not something that you need to be overly concerned about. If that happened, you would have acute pain. You would be seeking help without any hesitation. You don't need any underlying knowledge about that because your body will tell you that you need to seek help. But arterial disease that forms like this, this atheroma, is much more common. About 5% of patients over the age of 55 have significant arterial disease. But this disease doesn't come instantly overnight. It actually starts to form throughout the life of the, of, of the individual. So, you know, even if you're relatively young, if you've been a smoker, you may be one of these people that say, oh, it's not affecting me. I'd love to see inside your arteries because I'm sure that there will be some deposits within your artery. And interestingly, even if you've got deposits such as this, it doesn't start to give you symptoms until you really get to that final picture or the picture just before. So you can have blockages of your arteries up to 70%. And actually, they may not be giving you any symptoms, but it's creeping up over time. And therefore, it's something that you need to be aware of and try to reduce the chances of it happening. So what causes um, arterial disease? Well, we like to talk about it from a vascular point of view as vascular risk factors. And there's some of these that um, you can't do anything about. So we call them non-modifiable -mod risk factors. So it happens, arterial disease, more as you get older. As you go over 55, it starts to occur in the arteries. It happens more in men than, than females. Um, and we think that that's because of the female sex hormones. And there's very little you can do to change your actual base, uh, your base gender. There is some issues in terms of ethnicity. We know that there are populations that are much more likely to develop arterial disease than other ethnic origins. And like I said before, it, there is a strong family history. But unfortunately, they, there's very little that you can do about those. So we call them the non-modifiable risk factors. There is actually existing disease that you may have that actually increases your risk of developing significant arterial disease. So if you have diabetes, you have an extremely increased risk of developing arterial disease. If you've have ever had cardiovascular disease, um, or if you've ever had a stroke or a mini stroke, a TIA, or if you've actually known already to have peripheral arterial disease, you're more likely to get further disease in other vascular beds across the body. 
But actually, the ones that we really need to pay heed in says is these modifiable risk factors, because these are the ones that really impact the body's ability to repair and recover from this and actually how bad your symptoms may become. So the worst of these really is the smoking. Um, as I've said, many people say, oh, I've smoked for 20 years and I've got, a, I'm, I've got no issues. Hmm. The issues are coming. They're just lying beneath the surface at the moment and not giving you any issues. Um, many people also say to us, oh, um, my mother smoked for 50 years. She was absolutely fine. And then she dropped dead with an heart attack. She never developed cancer. Hmm. The heart attack was a direct result of the atheroma caused by the smoking. In fact, arterial disease is the thing that happens most when you smoke. Many people are worried about cancers, but actually the chance of developing cancer through smoking is much more, is much smaller than the chance of developing arterial disease. We know that, the, that if you are overweight, especially if you're diabetic and overweight, you've got an increased risk of developing arterial disease. We know that actually if you've got hypertension, it's a major risk factor and actually hypertension can be very well controlled with medication. And it's important that, that we try to optimize everybody's um, blood pressure to help them to prevent the development of arterial disease and reduce the chances of developing significant arterial disease. Maintaining a good cholesterol, and if you're a diabetic, maintaining a good glucose level will all help to prevent or reduce the chances of you developing arterial disease. But we have to remember that when we're talking about this arterial disease, it happens in any vascular bed. So we call the vascular beds, it can happen in the carotid arteries, and that's what causes an ischemic stroke. It's the same disease, the furring up of the arteries that causes a mini stroke, a TIA. And that's all because of the narrowing of the blood supply to the arteries of the brain or flying off little bits of cholesterol or clot from these narrowed arteries. It's the same disease that causes heart attacks or strokes in terms of it reduces the blood supply to that muscle of that heart. And that's when you can get angina or heart attacks, myocardial infarctions. But what we're concentrating on today um, is the arteries of the below the lower limb. Oh, and not to forget that arterial disease also can exist in within the kidneys. So the arteries that supply the kidneys. And if that starts to form, you can get problems in terms of the kidney function, but also control of your blood pressure. So from arterial disease, it prevent, presents in, a, in many forms. I think the first thing that we need to call out, though, is that actually you could have significant arterial problems in your lower legs and be asymptomatic. It may not be giving you any symptoms at all. And it's reported that around 8% of the population over the age of 55 could have asymptomatic arterial disease. But it can often present in the form of intermittent claudication. That's the first symptoms that many patients describe. It can, but rarely progresses to significant issues such as arterial rest pain, gangrene, or necrosis tissue loss. And we'll go into those in a little while. So the first is, is a symptom uh, that patients often describe is this intermittent claudication. Many of you out there might say, Do you know, my feet are cold um, and, and, and I think I've got problems with my poor circulation. I would say do not worry about the temperature of your feet because actually the temperature of your feet is controlled by the nerves, not the blood supply. So cold feet is nothing to be concerned about and is not instantly a, 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 a red flag that there is problems with your circulation. So like I said, claudication is often the first symptom that occurs, but what does this mean? Well, in terms of claudication, um, it's called a posh name, intermittent claudication. It's actually named after um, I. Claudius because he had a limp. And that's the whole 
reason behind this. So it means intermittent limp, basically. So when you get intermittent claudication, you may well have a narrowing of the artery in the thigh, and it's the thigh artery that feeds the oxygen into the calf. The patients often describe that they get pain on exercise and this happens because during periods of exercise the calf muscle is quite happy with the reduced blood supply whenever you're pottering around. But as soon as you start to exercise with any mission the need for oxygen and blood inside this muscle starts to increase. You get to a level of walking often around 50 to 100 yards where this muscle starts to scream at you for more oxygen and blood. And the patients often describe a significant cramping or vice type sensation within their calf muscle. When they stop for a minute or two, the pain starts to subside because the need for oxygen and blood starts to subside. But as soon as they start to walk again, the pain starts to return and they get to that level of threshold where they physically have to stop. The pain is much worse if you are walking up an incline or at a rush because you're needing more energy, more oxygen, more blood to get you up that hill. And it's really interesting that within intermittent claudication, it can happen in any of the muscles. So it can happen in the calf and it's the most common area for it to occur at the back of the calf, just like this picture. But it can happen to the thighs and it can even happen to your bottom. But actually the thing with intermittent claudication is it is exercise induced pain that relieves after a short period of rest. If you're getting this type of pain when you're in bed on a night time, it's not intermittent claudication. If you're able to walk three miles and then you get an achy symptom down the front of your shin, it is not intermittent claudication. This type of pain is never experienced at rest. So when you sat down or when you're in bed on a night time, the, if you're getting pain, it's much more likely to be muscular skeletal related, related to the bones or the muscles, rather than related to the arteries. But please don't think that we dismiss this. We really listen to your symptoms because actually intermittent claudication can significantly impact on a person's quality of life. You know, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse now nearly 30 years. I am looking forward to my retirement already. If you told me in my retirement I could only walk 200 yards before I got any pain, that would significantly impact on my retirement because I want to spend my retirement walking the Yorkshire Hills. We have patients who are still working at the age of 60 and intermittent claudication can impact their ability to work. So there are lots of things that we can do with you to help to improve your symptoms of intermittent claudication. But the first thing that we do is actually we try to address the modifiable factors. Our treatment has to focus actually on reducing the chances of you getting further arterial disease. Because we know that if a patient has problems with their arteries of their legs, they'll also have problems with the arteries around their heart and around their neck. Therefore, the patients with arterial disease are at an increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. And actually, our first treatment must be reducing the chances of that patient getting a heart attack or a stroke. So if you've gone to your doctor and they're only interested in your smoking and your tablets, not the pain in your leg, actually that's the right thing. Because initially your treatment must be about preserving your life, not about the pain in your legs at the start. So how do we treat people right at the very beginning? Well, the first thing that we do is we must advise on smoking cessation. That's the one thing that's going to really change your long-term outcome. It's about maintaining a healthy weight and undertaking regular exercise. It's vital that we control any evidence of high blood pressure with appropriate medication. Every patient who has peripheral arterial disease, it is advised that you take a statin. And the guidance from NICE, which is our national body that tells us what we do, says that patients should be on a Torvastatin 80 milligrams. 
I really appreciate that statins for some patients have got a bad name. That many patients think, gosh, you know, they give me nightmares or I've got, they give me more cramps in my leg. But actually, we need to have a strong conversation with you as that patient, because actually, this cholesterol medication is being used to reduce your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. And that's why we need to add it into the mix, because the last thing we want is for you to have a disabling stroke or even worse, a fatal heart attack. If you're a diabetic, it's right here and now that we need to pay heedance with your glucose control or your HbA1c control, because we know many diabetic patients have got a risk of ending up with minor amputations, losing toes, or if not losing legs. And that happens mostly in patients with diabetes and a combination with peripheral arterial disease. So again, treating you early, trying to stop you here in the pathway is absolutely vital. But your clinician will also give you another medication on top of your statin treatment. Your doctor will, or, or your nurse practitioner will also prescribe you an antiplatelet therapy. And the recommendation again through NICE is currently that we use clopidogrel 75 milligrams. And the reason for that is it thins the blood ever so slightly, therefore reduces its stickiness within the artery. So if you remember that picture of that third upper artery, having thinner blood helps it not deposit. Having less cholesterol in the blood through the statin uh, treatment helps that not to deposit and therefore not to make that stenosis, that narrowing within the artery worse. So, that is our first point of call. We need to stop the disease where it is. We need to prevent further vascular beds from becoming disease. And that's why we focus initially on the risk factors and the medication. But it's not that we are um, in unsympathetic, let's say, to the pain that you're getting in your leg. But actually, the first treatment of the pain in your leg actually is walking. And the reason for this is that we know that Mother Nature is a clever devil. And actually, Mother Nature will try to improve your blood supply on her own. So if you remember why I showed you that this artery disease doesn't happen instantly, it forms over time. As your arteries are getting narrower, your body starts to respond. And it responds through the growth of new blood vessels called collaterals. And you can see on this x-ray image here that there is good blood supply within the artery of the thigh. As you come, as it comes down, you can see that there is a blockage and then the native artery picks back up below this. Now, there is only one artery in this level of your mid thigh. And normally, if this artery was running, there would be nothing around this. But as you can see, Mother Nature has started to form some really beefy, big new vessels. So over time that she's grown these new vessels and actually has formed a natural bypass around the blockage. And what stimulates these collaterals to grow is exercise. Because when you exercise and when you get that pain in your leg, you have a release of something called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide stimulates something called a growth factor called VEGF, which is an actual arterial growing um, uh, uh, growth factor. So that stimulates these things to be formed. So even when you come to a hospital, our first treatment will, will, with you will always be to try exercise. And we recommend if you've got a diagnosis with um, peripheral arterial disease, that actually we encourage you to walk through the pain for an hour, at least three times a week to try to stimulate this growth of collaterals. Now, it's really interesting that actually pain is, is mother nature's really protective mechanism, because for anything else, if you get pain, you should stop doing it. If you put your hand in a fire, you get pain, you move your hand. If you get chest pain and angina, you need to stop doing it because your, your body's telling you you're getting into a critical position. But interestingly, 
the pain that you get on your calf through claudication won't do you any damage. The, that pain itself can't bring on a heart attack. It can't bring on a stroke. It can't bring on a blood clot. The worst it can bring on is basically a tear in your eye. So actually, we encourage patients to truly train like an athlete to try to increase their pain-free walking distance and their maximum walking distance to try to grow these collaterals. Obviously, if whilst you're exercising, you do get any central chest pain or significant breathlessness, then you should stop the exercise. But if it's just simply pain within the muscles, then actually you can regrow these blood vessels around. And the reason why we like to do that is that those vessels will be with you forever. So when you get 95 sat in your rocking chair with your blanket on your knee, those collateral vessels will still be running. If we as vascular were going to help with your arteries, where there is a couple of things we can do, we can do a thing called an angioplasty where we put a catheter down, we try to stretch open the artery, but that will only last around 10 years, if, if at the best. So really, you know, with growing these things yourself, you're going to cure yourself for the rest of your days. If we do anything to help improve the blood supply, then actually there is a lifetime, uh, sorry, sorry, there is a time limit of how long that that will stay viable and helpful for you. So our first initial treatment is always exercise. If that has failed, though, then we can look at stretching open the arteries with angioplasty. But we would always like a patient to be optimised from their risk factors before we proceed with that. For most patients that get intermittent claudication, actually the majority of them, their symptoms either improve or stay as they are. Please don't worry if you've got intermittent claudication that you think that you are going to lose your leg or develop gangrene because actually severe arterial disease where you get pain in the foot constantly or areas of discoloration like this is relatively rare. Only 1% of patients with peripheral arterial disease go on to get disease such as this. However, if you are experiencing pain on your foot constantly, which is worse on a night time when you go to bed, especially when you raise your leg in bed, and if you are finding that you get relief when you hang your leg out the side of the bed or walk around the room, and this is happening every single night, this is a, something that you need to seek urgent attention from your GP. If, and that's called arterial rest pain. If you are developing any lesions, dark, black areas, any lesions that look like this, any wounds on your toes that are not healing, if you have got, this is, can be an indication of severe arterial disease. And again, we need you to seek urgent ad medical advice. When I say urgent advice, that's not A&E, that's urgent getting to see your GP or some primary care practitioner, ideally within 24, 48 hours, they will refer you urgently up to a vascular service who should see you within a matter of days. You are much better being treated by an urgent outpatient route than actually going to A&E because through the urgent outpatient route, you get to see the right specialist at the right time. So, but please let me reassure you that worsening PAD is still extremely rare. So, um, just to summarise, really, of, of when should you be seeking help? Well, to me, you should be seeking help really when your symptoms first occur, because I think what's really important is that you get an accurate diagnosis. You need a clinician to say, yes, this is problems with your arteries, or actually, no, it's not. It's to do with the joints or the muscles or something else. And we need that accurate diagnosis, because if you have peripheral arterial disease, we as your healthcare practitioner need to focus on getting on your, the right tablets to reduce the heart attack and stroke risk and also to help you with your modifiable risk factors. But let's say if you've already seen a practitioner and that you've actually been diagnosed with arterial disease and you're addressing your risk factors, the first treatment you should be trying for intermittent claudication is improving your exercise by trying to get that walking of an hour 
three times a week, trying to walk through the pain wherever possible. You should always seek urgent help if you develop any symptoms of severe or deteriorating arterial disease. And obviously, seek help if you've simply got any questions or concerns. Your healthcare practitioner is there for you to help your generalised health, not just in a time of crisis. So if you have um, currently healthy arteries and no symptoms, and actually I've reassured you that the pains that you're getting in your legs is more likely to be uh, musculoskeletal, what can you do to reduce your risk of this arterial disease, especially if you've got a strong family history in the, in the past? Well, it all comes down to this healthy lifestyle. So the number one thing is don't smoke. Even if you smoke 50 years, if you stop smoking, Today, it will benefit your arteries of the future. It is never too late to stop smoking. From a vascular point of view, we're very happy if you vape. The thing that we don't like about the smoking is the tobacco, because it's that that actually furs up the arteries. If you are a diabetic, please, please take strict glucose control. Please don't be one of these that thinks, oh, I'll just cheat this weekend, I'll be fine. Unfortunately, diabetes is a bit of a ticking time bomb. It will come back to bite you in your future. So you really need to pay heedance with your diabetic control. Also, don't ignore your blood pressure. Hypertension is one of the major risk factors of arterial disease. And actually, it's the one that we're the worst at. So monitor your blood pressure. There's some great home devices. Don't worry about individual raised blood pressures. We're not that bothered about that. But what's good is if you are worried or if you're on heart uh, blood pressure medication is to take some random measurements of your blood pressure at random points of time over a week. And actually, that gives you a beautiful picture of your averaging blood pressure. And you can show that type of information to your healthcare practitioner. Try to maintain a healthy weight and take regular exercise. Your arteries love exercise. It's the thing that gets that beautiful big muscle pumping and it gets those arteries responding to that waveform of blood that's coming down. them. So I hope you found this session interesting. I hope I'll give you some information. And um, all of what I've talked about today really is summarised on the Legs Matters website. We've got a great section on cramp or pains in your legs when you walk in and what that could be. So please refer to that for any further information. And hopefully we may have a few questions. So I'm just going to stop sharing. I'm just going to go back to my little chat box and I might need to get a little bit closer because my eyes aren't that good. Um, so um, Kirsty's put, very informative session, thanks. I've experienced exercise induced pain in my calf while trying to walk more regularly to help my venous insufficiency and lymphedema. I don't have a diagnosis of claudication, but good to know that I continue walking and won't damage you any further. Um, I've stopped a few times now um, and I don't think you're doing any good. Oh, exercise, it's not doing you any harm whatsoever. If anything, Kirsty, it's gonna help um, your venous return is going to help your lymphatics because every time you squeeze that calf muscle foot pump you empty the veins and empty the lymphatics so that'll help you even if you do have arterial disease it won't do you any damage if anything it'll help to pro provide that collateral circulation I would just be cautious though Kirsty because I, you know if you're below oh, the age of 60 you're a, you're, you're a female at, at birth the chance of you developing significant claudication or arterial problems is really small. And um, so, you know, I myself has got pains now when I'm walking. Um, if I walk about a mile or walk quite fast, I get pains in my shins and actually pains on the lateral side of my legs. That's simply because during lockdown, we haven't been exercising as much. So remember that you'll always get a degree of muscle pain during exercise. But the one with claudication, a good tip is if you're getting pain when you're walking, if you stop, if the pain disappears instantly, it's more likely to be musculoskeletal, nothing to worry about. The claudication pain, when you stop, it doesn't go away straight away. It starts to diminish over time by about a minute or two before you can walk again. If it's stopping instantly, it's more likely to be musculoskeletal. If any of you out there are getting pain when you're walking, try that tip. 
get walking until you get your pain, stop. If your pain disappears, it's going to be musculoskeletal. It's not going to be related to your arteries. If the pain reduces over a period of time, it's more likely to be related to your arteries. So I would seek help with that. And Jessica's put on brilliant session. Thank you, Jessica. That was very kind of you. Um, so um, uh, Jane's asked, um, what are the main differentiating features between neuropathic and arterial rest pain in the feet? Um, I think that this is relatively easy. So neuropathic pain is caused by damage to the nerves or over sensation of the nerves, whereas arterial rest pain is caused by critical levels of ischemia. So neuropathic pain is more of a, um, a, a thunderbolt, an electric shock. It's there constantly. Um, it happens on the toes and the whole of the base of the foot. And the patient reports the foot, the pain shoots from the toes up the foot and it's there constantly. Arterial rest pain tends to happen at the most distal aspects of the foot. It doesn't feel like electric shocks. It feels like an intense, terrible pain. It is worse when they are in bed on a night time. And that's simply because of the elevation. At the end of the day, we're all human spirit levels. So gravity helps to get a few more drops of blood down to your feet when you stood up. When you're laid in bed on a night time, you're losing that gravity. You'll have a little bit less blood along with in the middle of the night, everybody gets a bit of hypoxia reduction in, 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 in the um, oxygenation of the blood. And that's what brings on the arterial rest pain. Arterial rest pain is relieved by hanging the leg out the side of the bed. And actually, when it gets to that point, by the sounds of it, you sound like a clinician talking about neuropathic and arterial rest pain. At that point in time, you'll often find that you've got a sunset red foot. That's an indication of arterial rest pain. And if you have that, what you need to do is to elevate the leg to the level of the hip and see if that redness disappears. It's called a Burgers test. So you get a sunset foot on dependency. As soon as you lift it up to the hip height, it starts to drain away and go white and pale. That's a good indication that there is a critical level of ischemia going on in that foot. I hope you found that helpful. Um, just lots of praise on those comments. So, so that's brilliant. I'm just gonna have a look in my question and answers. Oh, and there's none of those now. Brilliant. So um, I hope you found that session interesting um, and, and informative. It's going to be on our website for you so you can go back and respond to this um, and, and revisit it. Please remember that, you know, we are here to help. Um, we, as in your healthcare practitioner, we are interested and we, as in terms of vascular. So, you know, and there are many great vascular clinicians out there. They don't have to be a vascular surgeon. We've got great vascular nurses. And we've got great vascular podiatrists out there too. So, you know, there is many people that's very skilled in the management of vascular disease. If you've got any concerns, I would try your best to get in front of that specialist in terms of that vascular person, because they are the one that's going to be able to give you the greatest of confidence in terms of have you got arterial disease or not. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you're enjoying the Legs Matters Awareness Week. We've still got a few more events to come today. So thanks again for your support. And it's wonderful to have you here. Bye all.